I'd like to go ahead and get started this evening. I just want to start with a thank you to everybody who is joining us both remotely and um, in person. I'm getting a little feedback. Is my sound okay on your end? You're okay. Great. Um, so I just want to start by um, noting that you are all here as part of our Ocean Currents lecture series. Um, these meet every week on Thursday evenings, um, either in person or remotely. Uh, there are two options um, that work for you. Um, we love that we're reaching beyond just our little town of Lewis and uh, you know, moving uh, further out across the, the region and maybe even nationally. I do want to um, introduce our speaker this evening. Dr. Jennifer Biddle is a professor in the School of Marine Science and Policy. Marine Science and Policy sits within the College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment um, here at the University of Delaware. She has a bachelor's in biotechnology from Rutgers University and a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from Penn State. Then work are focused on microbes um, in all that kinds of different settings from the deep, deep ocean, many, many meters below the surface, the, the, the bottom surface of the ocean up into marshes that we can find uh, just across the way or down the street um, and all kinds of settings. She's even been involved in work, um, trying to understand what might be present on other planets. So even though she may not to want to um, uh, investigate meteorites that are brought into campus in Lewis, she might have a little bit more insight than she's letting on. Um, tonight, she's going to talk to us about microbes a little closer to home. And you'll notice um, she's got a, a second author on her talk, Malik Bowen, who's a grad student here. So, Jen, thank you very much for uh, doing this this evening. All right. Thank you, Joanna. All right. And thank you also to Malik. This is his. Um, basically started as a master's project. He's now gonna continue for a PhD. Uh, and so he's here to, to watch me, hopefully not screw this up. <laughs> so feel free to jump in and correct me if you need to, Malik. Um, all right, so uh, I'm here to talk to you tonight about microbes uh, and we should start by talking about what a microbe is. So we finally have a microbe emoji, which I was very excited about. Uh, unlike the hamburger emerge emoji, this one was done correctly. Um, and so uh, a microbe is basically a single cell, right? And we know that uh, they're unable to be viewed without a microscope. I put an asterisk on there because it turns out some of them can be seen with the naked eye. But tonight, most of the ones we're gonna be talking about are the really tiny ones that you can't see. You might hear them called fungi, bacteria, archaea. These are just different names we give to different types of microbes. These all fall in to things we can't see. And just to remind you that you know fungi include the yeast that make your beer and your bread and your wine. Um, the bacteria include the film that's on your teeth after you eat, right? You might be feeling that after dinner. And you might not have heard about archaea, but just know that they are a lot like bacteria. They just are a little bit different. One thing to know is that uh, microbes are everywhere, right? So everywhere we look on Earth, they exist. And the only two places they don't exist are when it gets too hot. So uh, Dr. York mentioned that I've been looking at things in deep sediments. It turns out sediments can actually get heated by the earth. So if it gets over about 120 degrees Celsius, we won't see any microbes there. But, so basically that's the only place they aren't. Uh, unless you are bleaching something or really trying to get rid of them, um, they won't be there either, but otherwise they're everywhere on earth. Things to know is that we can only grow about 1% of microbes in lab. And so this is something that's actually really impactful because we think about, if you know anything about microbes, you've probably heard about either being in food products or perhaps being pathogenic. That's still only a tiny percentage of total microbes in the world. So less than 1% of them are dangerous. Uh, and so again, you might've heard about things like E. coli and uh, Clostridium and anthrax, right? These are all things that microbes are or make. Uh, but again, very, very, very small minority of them are bad microbes. The other thing to know is that you're full of microbes. I would actually argue that you are a microbe. That's a story for another day, perhaps, but that you have about five pounds of them in you or on you. So when you think about that, where are they? They're mostly in your gut. Right? We know that there's something called a probiotic. There's reasons to eat yogurt and there's reasons to eat sauerkraut and things like that, kombucha, right? Lots of good things out there. This is partly to make sure that you have good microbes in your gut and gut systems are really uh, impactful for our health. 
So why should we care about microbes? Well, it turns out a small percentage of them are dangerous um, and they are everywhere. And so these are reasons to worry about them because they're little bioreactors, right? They react to the environment that's around them. And we wanna make sure that we're not doing anything to further the bad microbes that are out there, right? Including why the audience is masked. Thank you for sharing your, you know, keeping your viruses to yourself, um, but also keeping your microbes to yourself at that point. So one thing to talk about tonight is this idea that bad microbes can shut down beaches, right? So we think about water quality locally. Uh, we do have issues in terms of making sure that the microbes in our water are good, that you won't come into contact with bad microbes when you're out there. Uh, and if you read the news, you'll know that there's a lot of things out there, including the microbes on uh, oysters and other shellfish. There's always news about local hospital visits because of flesh-eating bacteria coming out of oysters. Again, these are my minority of situations, but just to remind yourself not to go into the water if you have open cuts and open wounds, and if you cut yourself on an oyster or a shellfish, clean the wound very carefully, very quickly. But when we think about um, overall water quality, we have to think about the fact that it's one of our most threatened natural resources. It's really important for keeping our health uh, safe, as we've seen across the country, different examples about harmful algal blooms creating toxic waters, about metals and waters being um, impactful. We have to think about the fact that we need to preserve it for agriculture, right? We can't grow our food sources unless we have a good water source. And then finally, we have to think about it in terms of recreation, that we wanna make sure that we have accessible areas for the public to enjoy, especially as the weather gets warmer. So what can impact water quality? So of course, we have to think about the anthropogenic, right? So human-induced impacts. To think about what agricultural runoff does. Um, so we were talking earlier before the talk started about the Chesapeake Bay. We know that there used to be huge issues with agricultural runoff into the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and still happens on a, a more local scale. There's been a huge push to stop fertilization of lawns uh, and go to a more natural environment for things like that. But we, of course, still have it for um, food agriculture. Uh, and so we have to think about the fact that there's runoff from that. We also have to think about the fact that there's sewage, right? And we treat our sewage and we try to release it into the environment in a controlled manner. And that's a process that's time tested and proven. But of course, we still have to think about the fact that we're releasing sewage into the water and making sure that it is tested. One thing to note also is that there are natural threats, right? The animals around us are using the water just as much as we do. And we have to think about the fact that it's not always us causing the issue. Sometimes it's other things causing the issue too. Oh, I hope we keep the internet going because there is booming thunder outside. So if we think about this idea of water quality and how microbes can play a role, we of course have to worry about pathogenic organisms and how they impact human health. So one thing to know is that in our gut or our gastrointestinal tract, our GI tract, we have something called enteric pathogens. And these are things that might be in us and not necessarily causing an illness because we're just a carrier or they're things that get into us and cause disease. So you might've heard of Escherichia coli or E. coli, right? It's a common contaminant of um, hamburger. It's actually been on lettuce a lot lately. There are outbreaks of it. They can be very bad and cause illness. There are other general coliforms, right? This just means it's basically a bacteria found in the colon. Uh, and enterococcus is another one that is known to cause issues with health. And this is in addition to a bunch of other organisms that basically are known to come from gut environments. And if you're not going through a clean process in terms of making sure that the water you're watering your lettuce with is clean or that the worker handling the lettuce is clean or that you're like not eating at Chipotle type issues, right? It always seems that that's the place where the outbreak is. Um, but that we have to have you know, clean processes in our food, but including clean water, right? Um, and when we talk about enteric pathogens, we can also call them fecal indicator bacteria or FIBs. And so this is actually the terminology that we give in terms of monitoring water quality. So who monitors water quality? Well, in uh, Delaware, we actually have Denerec that is in charge of this, but this is actually mandated through the Environmental Protection Agency. So the Clean Water Act uh, determines that each state has to monitor its waterways to determine whether or not they're impaired. And the impairment is based on a monitoring value called the total maximum daily load or the TMDL. And that's gonna quantify the fecal indicator bacteria in waterways. The idea with this is that if you go and do constant observation of the waterways, you'll be able to see when there's an issue. And if there is an issue, then you can shut down use of that waterway or control access to that waterway. 
In this, you hope to prevent the spread of those fecal indicator bacteria, which again, if you went swimming and swallowed some of that water, you could potentially then take those in and transmit disease. So this happens in our state um, all the time. This is monitored again, I said, by Generec. Um, and so we uh, have been looking at uh, working with Generec to better understand water quality through microbial means. So currently what Generic does is that they detect contamination by um, growing them. So this is called a culture-based assessment. I mentioned that not many bacteria grow in the lab. It turns out these fecal indicator bacteria usually do, partly because they're used to your gut, they're used to living in a nutrient-rich environment and they grow very quickly. Uh, and so this is an effective way of measuring the total microbial load or the total of the TMDL, um, but it doesn't give many details, right? It tells you if the numbers are high or if the numbers are low, but it doesn't necessarily, necessarily tell you where these microbes might have come from. It doesn't give you any information on you know, what source they would have been in, and it doesn't actually give you any information about what potential outcomes could be. So that's all that the Clean Water Act requires, right? It's just a simple count of what is being cultured in the lab. Uh, and then you can basically tell whether or not a waterway is impaired. Could some of these be good bacteria? So typically what we're measuring by culture are ones known to be bad. So we, we basically look at characteristics of them. And I should say the characteristic is that they grow in a certain type of sugar and they make a certain type of gas when they grow. So it's pretty, um, you know, it's basically saying like this has the potential to be bad, but you don't know whether or not it's E. coli or Enterococcus, or you don't, you don't know any of the other details about it. So something else that I should mention is that the fecal indicator bacteria are not only human derived, there's also um, animals have guts, right? And so all of the guts of animals have the potential to hold fecal indicator bacteria also. Uh, and so this Clean Water Act, the, what they require doesn't determine whether or not it's, it's just from a gut source. It doesn't tell you what gut it's from. So how else can we detect microbes in the environment? So I stole this image off the internet um, because of this little picture of the DNA inside the microbe. So something that my lab um, has gotten very good at is getting DNA out of the environment and using that to study the microbes in the environment. And by doing that, we're able to get really refined details about what microbes are present in the environment. And what's really impressive is that microbes are so distinctive in the area that they grow that actually, if I uh, basically, you know, so we, so we walked in here, right? All the chairs were empty and then you sat down. And if I was able to sample you on the way out by just taking a swab off your arm, and then I sampled all the chairs, I could probably reconstruct the seating pattern of the room by just seeing what microbes were on the chair, right? So that's sort of how distinct the signatures are. We can actually track things back to individual organisms sometimes, or at least to the system that it comes from. So why do we do this? It's called microbial source tracking, and it's detecting DNA from microbes in the environment without having to grow them. It gives us better detection limits in terms of this idea if you had one fecal indicator bacteria that grew versus 100 that didn't, and actually the number is probably like 1,000 that didn't, um, we have a much better detection limit of determining what sources things are from. And theoretically, we could look at point source pollution um, in terms of this idea of, again, if I went and sampled your septic tank, and then sampled the water outside your house, I could probably tell you whose septic tank is leaking, right? And so we can get actually really defined information on the microbial structure of the environment. So I was actually um, really excited when uh, this project was pitched to me. And this was actually pitched to me by Denrek, um, by my colleague, Christopher Main. Uh, and part of the reason for that is Chris was actually a student here. So he got his PhD here and I was on his committee and I still don't hold it against him that he forgot the nitrogen cycle and how it worked when he was doing his defense. We'll, we'll let that one slip. <laughs> um, but he's been employed by Denrek and he was sort of getting frustrated at how little information we had in terms of assessing local waterways. So we came up with this idea, which isn't a novel idea. There's a lot of people using this idea, but could we do microbial source tracking in the environment? With this idea that we have populations in the environment of like agricultural animals like cows and chickens, and they have distinct populations of microbes. We have natural populations of things like raccoons and shorebirds. Um, and actually it'll probably be in the news at some point that the dolphins are responsible for messing up a beach. Well, that's still not proven really, but that we have natural organisms that are also contributing their sources to the environment. 
Finally, we have anthropogenic influences like humans, and of course the animals that are around humans like dogs. Could we track these into the water and deconvolute what signals were coming into the waters? And this way it would tell us, is there a anthropogenic influence? Is it a natural influence? And this has been done in some other environments. What's really interesting is there's some studies that I think it was Finland where they actually found it was dog waste that was contributing most to the fecal indicator bacteria in local waterways. And so they did a community push to make sure people cleaned up their dog waste. Um, and so, you know, we started with this idea of, is it a sort of a, a simple problem or is it a more complex problem in terms of looking what's in the local waterways? Question. Question. No fish? Well, of course the fish are in there, but uh, yeah, we'll ignore them at this point. <laughs> um, and so of course, you know, everything in the local environment is like, well, we're just gonna use the word poop a lot. So we'll just start, we'll break that seal and we'll just start using the word poop a lot. Everything in the environment poops, right? Um, except some worms actually, worms, some worms don't poop. But, um, but of course we have to think about the fact that there's a lot of potential contributions. So I'll get into the details in a second, but we actually did not include fish. And part of that is just, so now I think about it, it wouldn't be that hard to have fish poop, but you know, we just didn't think about it at the time. Um, and so we were thinking mostly about things that are on land and having sort of washing into the environment versus things that are internal to the environment. Does that make sense? Yeah, but we're really just looking for hazardous, right? Yeah, the other good news is actually, and the way the fish gut works, they typically don't house the same kind of fecal indicator bacteria compared to something like a dog or a cat would have it. So, um, so let me tell you a little about the watersheds we're looking at. So one of them is a local watershed. I don't know if anyone lives, lives out near Love Creek, um, but Love Creek is basically uh, running towards the southern part of Delaware. Um, my mouse, my mouse go. So here we are. All right, so if we look here, this black line going across the map here is Route 24, here's Route 1, right? And so Love Creek is going to have this watershed drain into um, the inland bays here. And if we look at this, this is showing the septic system density. So here you have a higher density septic system, oops, a higher density septic system, right? And then we have other septic areas around here. And um, ideally you have a lower density up here. However, if we look at the land use changes, so this goes from 1992 to 2012, and then for further proposed development areas, this is an area where there are a lot of new developments coming in, right? And of course, this is the local debate around here is that not all of these developments have sewer running to them, right? So I know myself, I'm on septic um, and we worry about the integrity of our septic tanks and making sure that our, you know, we're keeping our waste properly treated, but that to think about how we manage the infra infrastructure locally, that not all of these developments are going to be um, connected by pipe, right? So if we think about um, the local area, what, is, what do the numbers look like? Um, and so this is some data that was from uh, Denrec. And so this is typical monitoring that was um, occurring. And so if we look here, these are just a bunch of different sample IDs, and this is looking at routine uh, monitoring. Uh, we monitor things like ammonia, dissolved organic carbon, total organic carbon, chlorophyll A, dissolved oxygen, and then finally, here's that entero number. So this is the count number that is seen for those microbes. So if we look here at the ones with asterisks, these are actually determining that this waterway is impaired when that number gets high. So the upper limit for the entero measurements is 185 for freshwater and 104 for salinity. And as you can see, we're hitting numbers of 1630, right? This is a high number for gut bacteria. And so Love Creek is definitely an area of sort of um, intrigue to try to think about why do we see cons consistently these numbers go up. Now, one thing to mention is that microbes I mentioned are little bioreactors. They usually respond to what's around them. So what's interesting is to look at, we looked at the variations of nitrogen, we looked at the variations of carbon. Now these numbers vary a little bit, but they don't vary that much to mean that the microbes should be growing or in, uh, influenced by the nutrients, right? So there's this disconnect between nutrients getting into the water versus fecal indicators getting into the water, right? So this raises the question in our heads is when we see these high microbial accounts, where are these microbes coming from? We don't have evidence to say that there's a natural nutrient base supporting them. And so maybe it's that that's when the snow geese came through and pooped all over the environment, right? We don't know sort of what influences are happening 
And we wanted to try to deconvolute what would be going on. So we weren't necessarily the first people to do this. We actually had Chris at Denrick did an initial study in Love Creek. And so I want to show you some of the data he came up with. So this is a, um, a look at Love Creek on some different sampling stations. And what he was able to do is determine the fecal source based on a library. So here he had chicken, cow, duck, goat, goose, horse, human, pig, sheep, and unknown. And as you can see here, this blue color is unknown. It means that half of the microbes are you know, unaccounted for in terms of where they're coming from. But what was really interesting was sort of the large signatures he saw for other organisms, including um, things like uh, cow and horse, right? And so this is sort of disconcerting. Is there a farm nearby that perhaps is, is seeding this waterway with signatures from cows and horses? We also see that in his initial study, there's this purple color, right? And this is a human signal. And so there does seem to be some evidence that there's human contributions at some points in the watershed. What's interesting is he went out and measured again after a rainfall. And this is sort of why we didn't worry as much about fish, because the rain is going to pull in a lot of water to that watershed. And what you see here is you lose the human signal. You actually drop some of the livestock signals. Um, and so there's a bit of a shift here in that uh, pig got more apparent with some of the rain. But again, this idea that the way the water is moving into the uh, local body of, you know, the local body of water uh, might be shifting based on the hydrodynamics of the environment. Right, so this is very initial data that he looked at. Um, he also did a more longitudinal study of Love Creek. And so here is uh, the graph of what he was looking at here of different sampling stages over time. So here it's looking from March uh, down through the summer uh, into October. And what was really interesting about this data set is as we look about what's going on across the environment, we see that in the winter months, so if we think about sort of March and April being on the low end of the, the usage area, um, we see that there's this uh, tan bar and then this red bar are getting more apparent sort of as the tourists come in. Um, and what was interesting is that these are signatures of dog and cat, right? And so does this mean that perhaps the population, right? Remember that the in-town population of Lewis, I don't know if it's still, it used to be 40% occupancy year round, right? So we have this huge influx of people that come in the summer. And this might be changing a lot of what we see going on. Now, this did make us scratch our heads a little because I didn't understand how cat would be such a huge influence. Usually cats are pooping in a litter box, right? We would hope that most people keep their cats inside because we like wild birds. Now we do know that there's stray cats everywhere and there's a lot of efforts to sort of handle stray cat problems, but it never struck me that Love Creek should be an area where there's like a ton of stray cats and their signals getting into the water. So this definitely made me scratch my head a little bit. And I was a little suspect that maybe something wasn't right with this data. Are cats contaminating Love Creek? Probably not. But of course, we were ready to go full force with the make sure you keep your cat inside and using a litter box campaign if needed. But what we decided is we needed a much more comprehensive study of potential library sources. So now I'll launch into the data that Malik has generated, and this is um, with Denrec in terms of doing the collections. So what we did was we expanded our look, and we looked across three different watersheds. So in the north, we looked at the Murderkill River. Again, if you're watching online, just keep in mind that we have a huge Dutch influence in the area. Murderkill isn't some sort of drastic name. It means mother river um, that just comes out as Murderkill, which freaks all of our students out. But yeah, it means a mother river. So um, the Murderkill River is in Kent County. Um, it's sitting up here. This is a uh, map that Malik was able to generate. And the sort of the, the dot here is what we're looking at. And then these um, gray and white circles are actually buffers of different farm areas. So we looked at land use around each of these uh, watersheds and tried to sort of make some guesses at what would happen. So in the Murderkill River, we have the outflow from the Kent, Kent County treatment plant going in there. Um, there's actually a lot of development around it and sort of not as much farmland. In the Broadkill, which is sitting down here, which just runs out uh, behind us, uh, it's got a heavy agricultural influence. You can see that basically farm buffers are sitting all around that watershed. And then finally looking at Love Creek, which is down here. We see that there is that agricultural influence, but it's also got a heavy human influence. If you remember that septic map I showed you before. 
Okay, so we launched into our study, and of course, this was immediately impacted by COVID. So we're about a year behind where we thought we would be initially. Um, but one of the things we did was we wanted to collect as many sources as possible. So we collected uh, over 124 total samples, and I do have to give a shout out to our poop patrol, as we refer to them, um, because we, am I allowed to curse? I don't know, is this being recorded? Yeah, but it, well, I'll, anyway. but we said we really need people who know their shit. Um, and so uh, we went out and were able to get samples from a lot of the state biologists and people in different Denrec offices, um, also just people who knew what scat looked like. Uh, including um, me convincing Malik that, no, trust me, I know where geese poop, I can find those samples, right? And so uh, we were able to collect a bunch of different organisms, right? And of course, these might be um, some domestic organisms like cattle and chicken. I will say this was actually a genius move by our colleague, Chris. He went to the Delaware State Fair. And if you've ever been to the Delaware State Fair, you know that all the animals are kept there in a barn. And so he walked down the aisle and said, do you mind if I take some of your cow's poop? Uh, and so thank you to everyone who had animals at the state fair who, let, uh, who had samples for Chris. And so that's where most of the domestic animals came from. Uh, we also had friends deliver their cat uh, scat to us and their dog scat to us. Um, and then uh, you know, we sort of went through in terms of different organisms that we thought would be around and thankfully had folks like the state biologists give us otter scat and things like that. So this is our best guess at who might be pooping in the watersheds. Um, what's surprising is that a lot of these uh, organisms actually aren't managed or even counted by the state. Um, so we actually have no idea how many raccoons are living on the broad kill, right? So it's sort of surprising. I thought it, we might have a better handle on some things like this, but they only track, was it deer and turkey, I think, um, out of most of these organisms. And so we have no idea what the local otter population is like. We don't know what the raccoons are like. They're just animals that aren't ever counted. Now, I will just say to let you know, I have really embraced Sussex County. I have chickens and goats in my backyard. And so this is actually something that's close to home. My property sits on an area that would drain eventually into the broad kill. And so I was a little bit worried when I started doing this study, am I gonna be able to track my chickens into the broad kill? And, and you know, I wanna have to build some sort of water barrier fence around my property. You know, like, this is an actual thing that's happening. Um, and so we got a total of 128 samples of poop, basically. We also collected sediment from each of these rivers. And part of that is that all of these rivers, these bodies of water are tidal. And so the pulling of salt water and fresh water moving back and forth actually moves around a lot of the sediment at the bottom of the river. So instead of thinking about fish, we thought about the fact that basically that murky stuff in the water, that's mostly floating sediment. And that could be a huge contributor to the microbial load in sediment or in the water also. So then we sampled the waters over time. Um, and so each one was sampled uh, and basically filtered onto a filter. So there's a total of 308 total filters. Uh, and this was achieved by the Denrick folks that were doing their common sampling. And then we actually went out in small boats. Um, when the weather was really bad, we just sampled from the shore. And one time when the weather was really good, we went by kayak. Um, and so we were able to do some small boat sampling for this. From all of these, we extracted the DNA. And basically what this is, is we chemically ground up the material. When you do that, you can burst all the microbes and get their DNA out. And then we take their DNA and uh, you know, clean it. And we're able to then do a process where we sequence a small piece of a main gene of the bacteria. If you're watching online and you know about this, it's the small subunit ribosomal RNA or the 16S ribosomal RNA. What you should know about this is basically this is the gene that gives us a bacterial name, right? It's the best way to determine who a bacteria is. Um, and so we looked at that. We then do a lot of computational analysis, which of course is one line on here, but it's like two years of Malik's life. Um, and so we are at this point, all of the data is in the computer. Um, we are running into these fun problems, including we have so much data that like our files are too big to transfer anymore. And so I will just let you know before we start talking about that, this, this project is not done. Um, and part of the reason is that we want to sort of look at more defined levels. Uh, when we talk about bacteria, we can think about there might be over 10,000 types of bacteria per sample. And if you think about doing sort of a matrix comparison of there's 10,000 bacteria in this sample and there's 10,000 in that sample and you start trying to compare them, very quickly you basically run out of computational ability. Um, and if anyone is into computers, I can let you know that there is actually a um, background rule in uh, different programming, including the language R, 
where it's about a background of Fortran, and it basically lets it stops you from doing sort of a matrix calculation of over a million by a million. I had an old calculus teacher that would always tell you if you try to solve something like that, it'll be the second coming of Jesus. Um, and so basically we've run into these sort of computational issues where we're realizing that like, okay, we have so much data and it can be so complex that we have to sort of figure out ways to kind of deconstruct some of the data. So I mentioned that the culture-based effort is really like not many details and it's pretty like a bulk method. And now we're on the total side of that of like totally being in the weeds and having so much data that it's actually really hard to analyze. All right, but here's what the process looks like. There's Malik um, picking up the samples from Denrec. Uh, and so thanks to Paige, who was one of our interns who worked on this. We also had an intern last year, Trevon, who worked on this. Um, and basically, you know, the poop samples up at the top here, and then uh, some of the filter samples of the water that we collected. Um, and so we're able to look at everything. And we also do have the information of nutrients and um, chemical values for all of these too. But tonight I just wanna give you some of the initial details of what we found. And I will just say that this is all like not for the press. Um, this is all an initial look. Uh, and so don't freak out and call your local agencies. We're still figuring all of this out and we'll definitely be talking to Denrec about what we found and figuring out how to proceed. Okay, so let's first talk about the Murder Kill River watershed. And so I mentioned that we have the Kent County treatment plant up here. Um, if you look here, there's the mouse, here we go. So here's Bowers Beach. This is basically where it comes out into the ocean. And as we look through the watershed, you can see that we're running through a couple of different areas, um, coming up from areas like Killens Pond State Park. Of course, it drains in this direction. Um, and then we have a big marshy area here, but this actually does have like, a lot of um, uh, buildup around it. And so when we looked at the Murder Kill River, we saw that station by station, we did this process through what's called Source Tracker. And Source Tracker tells us what in our library is most likely contributing to the population we see in the water, right? So everything is sort of this library background of all of those animals we collected, comparing it to the population in the water. So one of the first things we found, oh man, that, that color didn't come up that well, but um, one of the first things we found, this is from May, 2020. Um, and here is our color code of our library, right? So as you'll first notice, there's no bulls. Okay, that's fine. Um, but as we look across the different stations, we see that there's this huge contribution of this sort of uh, orangey, peachy color. Um, and that is actually coming up as what we called a human sample. So Denrick was able to get a couple different samples for us that are human related. So again, not an individual human, but they're sort of bulk human. In that the human that we have listed here were three samples from the Seaford Mobile Gardens Home Park sewage treatment. And so this is a partially treated sewage material that was collected. And then we also have down here this color that um, kind of actually gets hidden on this graph, but it's from called treatment facility. And these are two samples from the Bridgeville sewage treatment plant, or sorry, three samples from the Bridgeville sewage treatment plant and two from the Kent County wastewater treatment plant. So what does this mean? It means that we're actually seeing, again, this is treated water, but again, this should be, you know, basically safe to interact with. Um, but we do see this is actually a big contribution from the Kent County Wastewater Treatment Plant, which sort of carries through, gets diluted out a bit as you get towards the ocean. And then we have this other sample here from this home park sewage treatment. And basically what we're sort of saying is that this sample is kind of reflected of what a septic sample might look like, right? This idea that it's sort of partially treated, um, but still not completely treated. We do see that yeast come up as a signal that is contributing. Uh, we do surprisingly see, and this is, we're gonna start talking about otters a lot, which is something I never thought I'd be talking about in a talk, but otter keeps popping up. Um, and then as we mentioned, we did collect sediment. So we do see some sediment influences here. It means there's basically a rush into the uh, water population that might be from sediment. And the, the area of this makes sense. This is where that tidal influence of the saltwater versus freshwater would happen. Um, there's some minor contributions over here, including um, some chicken, some rabbits, right? So there are some other signals coming through. But again, the major signal that comes through are these anthropogenic influences, which sort of maps onto the water treatment plants or the sewage treatment plants, and then this potential septic signal. signal. This um, percent of the population? So it's not necessarily abundance, but it's sort of like what sources would be coming in and then at what influence, right? So here you'd be looking at this idea that this sample is mostly a human influenced uh, population that you're able to track into it, but it doesn't tell you, is it 10% of the fi final population or is it 50% of the 100 is not 100%? 
Um, no, it's just basically the proportion that is potentially going into it, but it doesn't tell you about the final abundance in that final sample. And right, so it's this idea of like a dilution, but we don't know what that dilution is yet. And again, it doesn't that's, tell you what the level is. No. It could have been very low. Yes, so that's something that, again, we'll, we'll get to in the future, but we haven't been able to look at that calculation yet. <clears throat> um, so as we look at this over time, I pulled out a couple different months. Um, if we look in July, we see that the otters are taking over a bit. We still have that sediment signal coming up at samples eight and nine. Um, we do step into the unknown here, where there's some unknown influences coming into the, the water. Um, again, that the signals are changing over time, and this could be due to anything from how um, recently the rain happened to this idea that actually water level changes in the summer entirely, and so the water uh, transfer moves. Uh, as we move into November, you see that the system gets a little bit um, more sort of evened out. Uh, we actually, now we're in the winter, we have sort of less influence of a lot of the animals. Our sediment influence has also changed a bit. It's still coming up on samples eight and nine uh, primarily, but we do seem to have a stronger anthropogenic influence, um, and then the rest is unknown at this point. So this was sort of surprising to see that the, this human type signal was sort of so abundant in terms of what is potentially contributing. Um, but again, this was an area where there was only like three farms and they were kind of further away from the environment or from the river. Um, and we do have a major wastewater treatment plant sitting on this um, area. Again, this isn't saying any of these are bad. It's just saying where the microbes would have come from uh, if they were able to be identified. Um, so the kind of scratching our head thing was otters. Like, why did that come up as a signal? Um, otters and rabbit were sort of unexpected things that came up. Um, and we're still looking into some things about, you know, is this truly an otter signal? A lot of the otter samples we got, the otters actually had pooped on leaves. Um, and so we were wondering is perhaps like did a leaf signal come in and maybe that was sort of a mistake. Um, but then on May 31st, this was in the Cape Gazette. I don't know if you saw this article, right? About otters wreaking havoc on koi ponds. Again, a reminder that we have no idea how many otters are in Delaware, right? And apparently they're causing problems everywhere. So they wind up showing up in our data. Um, Again, a surprise, something that, again, we are looking into. So it's this draft data. We're not really sure exactly if the otters are causing so many problems, but they did apparently eat all the koi. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so in the Broadkill River, um, we're looking at samples that basically uh, go up to Waffles, Waffles Pond um, from downtown Milton uh, through the Oyster Rocks area, again, out to sort of where we are right now um, in terms of this uh, watershed. And so we looked at all of these samples and did the sort of time series analysis. And so what we saw here was that um, this is basically looking, again, there's human potential influences here, but the human signal actually looked more uh, like this uh, water treatment facility than the potential septic signal that we see in this peachy color. Again, the otters were all over the place here, along with some rabbit. Um, we do see that there's a lot of diversity of potential sources coming in from different animals here. Um, and this sort of makes sense when you look at the map um, in terms of what's sort of housed in this area, in terms of there are a lot of local horse farms and things like that. But again, mostly an anthropogenic signal. What was kind of surprising was this, um, this brownish bar at the top. This is actually turkey. Um, and we did seem to have a pretty robust turkey signal. You can actually tell the difference between turkeys and chickens and ducks and geese. That was one thing we started with. We didn't know if we could ever tell that signal. And just one thing to mention is that not all of the samples we had were sort of perfect from the animal samples. Like when we sampled geese, we actually sampled them as dried up geese feces on a sidewalk. Um, and so this would be an example of sort of what could get washed out. So we were actually pretty loose in terms of how old the poop was and how if it had been sitting for a while. Um, and so again, surprised actually that you could actually tell those animals apart with this data. Uh, the stations are like number one up in uh, Milton and then 12 is near the ocean. Yeah, so number one is all the way over here. And then um, for some reason, 12, uh, 11 and 12 are actually up north and then nine was sort of the outflow. No, okay. um, so if we look here, so again, nine, you know, we have potential more um, natural sources around and less uh, potential human sources. So it's affected too by how much marsh area is around, isn't it? Because marsh are general filters. Potentially, yeah. And that's actually, we did sort of expect that we should see, you know, is the signal traveling with the water or is there enough coming out of the water? 
Um, one thing that we was actually surprised here is we didn't see this. I thought we'd see a higher sediment signal because in the broad kill, there's actually a huge turbidity zone where I thought we'd capture more of the sediment, but we didn't, weren't able to capture that. Um, there's just a little sliver actually where I expect to see it. What's really interesting as we go through time, again, the otters are wreaking a bit of havoc in some of these areas, but Turkey actually gets bigger. Um, and so we start thinking about like, okay, if you're going to raise turkeys, when do you usually get them? We don't have a turkey farm locally. The turkey farms are TA farms, or there's one in the south, but there shouldn't be any in the broad kill. Um, so we're still scratching our heads a little bit on that one. Uh, as we move into November, of course, that's Thanksgiving time, and the turkey signal gets even stronger. Um, and so we wondered, did it all go away after November and Thanksgiving? But apparently, the turkey hunters might not have been that effective, because there was still so, some signal left in January. Can you tell the DNA difference between a domestic turkey, farm raised, and a wild turkey? That's a great question. I, we do not have the data to tell that. Yeah, OK. And I was just thinking, like, what else could we? Maybe we could try that for a goose. But yeah, we haven't we haven't gotten into that level yet. Would the otter be confused by uh, muskrats? We do not have a muskrat, so I cannot tell you if it's different than an otter. There should be a lot of muskrats in this area too. Again, some of these, I mean, definitely it made me scratch my head. Um, and to think about what else could be happening. Uh, so again, this is initial data. We'll see. I don't think I don't want to say that you know we shouldn't go to Denmark and say turkeys are contaminating the broad kill. Um, but it's definitely something to look into. And we've actually been talking to Denrak about sort of this idea of, is it really a turkey signal or could we find a chicken signal and, and how that's working? The um, pH level, the uh, variety of pH level in the poop make a difference at all? So that could make an overall difference to the um, sort of overall picture of the microbes. And this is why we would expect sort of like a ruminant should all look, they should all look pretty similar. What was really surprising is we can actually tell the ruminants apart. Um, sometimes a, a horse looked like a goat, but not all the time. Um, and so uh, most of the time we were able to tell them apart, uh, basically based on the animal they are. Um, so it is pretty distinct that way. All right, so the last one I want to talk about is Love Creek. Um, and so just to let you know, this is a bit simpler, right? So we actually go um, up here where our top sample was just off of the retreat at Love Creek. Uh, we are actually, thanks to some uh, homeowners, we were able to use their kayak dock. Uh, and then we actually went through under 20, Route 24. We never hit the bridge, I don't think. We got stuck a couple times. We never hit the bridge. Um, and then out into basically our last sampling site is basically off of like where the Rehoboth Country Club is. And so just to remind you, here's our septic system density. So we do expect that the septic is sort of highest up here and would perhaps flow down, um, and then it should be lower in this area. And so I put all of these on one graph just to talk about what happens here. Uh, and so what was really surprising is that Love Creek looked a little simpler. Um, and what we do see is that we have what we're calling our, the otters are still there, um, but we have what we're calling our septic signal, right? So this uh, uh, human signal that we see from this uh, Seaford treatment plant and it is highest at that station one, and it goes down as you get towards the Rehoboth Bay. Uh, it looked the same in um, from this is June to August. Down here is July. We should note that this is sampling after high rain. Uh, and so here we're seeing a lot of things, including sediment and rabbit and otter. So this does look like the sample is sort of washed with a different material. And we get back to September, and things have calmed back down again. And so Love Creek did seem to be sort of the most simple one in that we are sort of following the influence of a septic field potentially, uh, and that we do have this anthropogenic influence. And I'll just note that the black uh, bars here are all unknown, right? So it means that this is basically something that's not in our library. And again, the bacteria could just be living in the river. They're just natural bacteria in the river, or it's coming from fish or something else. Um, but it did seem that there's a pretty distinct signal in terms of that flow into the um, Rehoboth Bay. All right, so. You said on the first top left corner that the orange is going down, but you really don't know whether the orange is going down or the black is going up. Is that correct? True. Yeah. And so basically it means that we have the highest influence of that human sample on this station one. And then that influence is lower at the other stations, but we don't know exactly which way things and are going. Seven was where it dumps into the bay. Yeah. And so seven is usually full salt water. Um, and so as you can see, it, it seems connected. Uh, as, again, after a huge rain event, there's actually enough freshwater push that that freshwater signal then seems to get out that far. And that was reflected in the salinity too. 
Um, so yeah, so our initial results are a little bit confusing. Otters are perhaps wreaking havoc in the area, um, but, uh, but that we show the potential influence of human impacts locally. Um, and if we think about the watersheds in that we did expect the murder kill to be sort of more human influence, we expected the broad kill to be a little bit more agricultural, and then we didn't know with Love Creek um, which way would things would happen. It actually is sort of matching our expectations of how we know these waters were impacted in the first place. Um, again, all of these waters are different, like de depending on the month when Dunrec samples, they become impaired over time and we still didn't know where the bacteria are coming from. Um, so we're currently investigating why that human source changes, why does sometimes it looks like the wastewater treatment plant and sometimes it looks like this uh, treatment facility in, um, that we got from Seaford. And so we're sort of trying to map through that. I think that there's different types of microbes in those solutions. And again, these are not microbes that we typically say are bad but it's more that these are where we find these microbes, right? It's sort of like finding your close associates. Um, and so even though the bad microbe not be, might not be, be being detected, the source is potentially that same type of source. Does it make sense, right? So again, these are good microbes, but the source of them most likely came from that area of our library. Um, we saw that the animal impact varies a lot based on where we sample and when we sample, and we were totally unexpected, and our otters a menace, this should have been the title of my talk, is otters are potentially a huge menace. <laughs> um, and so this does require follow-up work, and so that's what we're going through right now. And we want to examine the sequences at a final, finer level just to see, again, if, you know, if the otter poop was sampled on a leaf, are we actually pulling something from a leaf as a signal? And then it would make a lot more sense compared to an otter going crazy. But again, they ate all the koi and Lewis. So who knows? We'll, we'll see if the otters are a true menace. Um, one of the benefits of this analysis is that we have a large library of sequences for comparison. Um, and we actually just got a call from Denrec, was that yesterday or today? Uh, yesterday, yesterday, I think, um, where they said, could we tell if a pond is contaminated by chickens, by a local chicken farm, or geese, right? So of course, the homeowner or the farm owner is going to say, well, that pond has geese on it all the time. It's not my chickens. And could we actually do some back calculations to figure that out? Um, and this is just showing a diagram that basically color codes the different sources. And if the things are close, it means that they're similar. And if they're far apart, they're different. Um, and so we do see that here's our blue chicken, our blue hens, huh? nice. Um, and then our geese are over here. And it does seem like we're able to deconvolute those samples. And so the answer to Denrec is we'll give us a sample of that water in that pond and we'll tell you whose poop it is. Um, and so it's a useful technique uh, and perhaps maybe a little too sensitive in terms of determining that rabbits and otters are ruining our waterways. Um, but again, this is not uh, a ruining, right? It's just a source. It's, we're not saying any of these are actually bad. Um, overall, we have a huge hope for improved water quality. If we could better understand what's going into the water and help sort of direct or, or filter or treat that before it happens, uh, we have a chance of, um, changing the anthropogenic and natural influences in the watersheds. And we want to make sure that we're keeping an eye on not only the nutrients, so of course we want to make sure that there's not overrun of fertilizer, but that also thinking about land use uh, decisions around a watershed can really impact the waterway impairment. And one thing we've definitely learned is that the time series uh, views are really valuable ways to observe watershed impairment. Because again, there could be something that isn't impairing a watershed until there's a large rain event. And we certainly have a lot of those in the area. And of course, they're expected to increase with increasing climate change. Um, so again, if we're going to have huge pushes of water through the environment, we have to think about where they could be depositing um, and moving things and how they'd be influencing things. All right, so my take home message today isn't to remember that it's human poop or turkey poop or anything like that, but just to remember that microbes are sentinels of the environment and understanding them could lead to improved ecosystem management, um, but there's a lot of shit out there. So um, we need to think about uh, how, how our anthropogenic and natural influences are moving things around. Um, and so again, just to thank Malik for doing all of this work uh, and producing his basically master's thesis that he's now skipping to get his PhD. Um, and also my colleague, Chris at Denrec and all of our poop locals, including our state biologists um, and all of the people who asked, answered my dumb questions about like, do we know how many otters live in Delaware? Um, and so we've had a lot of folks uh, uh, involved, including some local hunters. And so of course, great people who know SCAT. Um, and thanks to Delaware Sea Grant for funding this work. Um, and that's funded through the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Association. Um, so thank you for coming to listen tonight, and I hope you enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been great.
when you take a boat ride through the canal through Lewis, you see the otters and you see couples pairs. Yeah, they're cute. Yeah, I never thought that that, you know. Well, now when I look at them, I don't know. <laughs> Red Mill Pond also has water. Yeah, so we didn't. Uh, well, I think there's one sample that comes off of Red Mill Pond, but I don't know if it, it popped up with the. Uh, yeah, so a lot of this is this idea of how much, um, you know, the, the old joke is, of course, that dilution is the solution to pollution. Uh, and so we have to think about, you know, how, how some of these areas, you know, are they flowing water? How, is it stagnant water? You know, is, is the animal's nest right there? And that's where the sampling point was. There's still all of these questions that we sort of need to keep asking. And just what happens to the land? Like where we live now, there are no more cows. They got rid of the cows and not far from that land between Route 9 and what's the other way? Dam? Sweet Brook. 23. Beaver Dam? Nine and twenty-three. Beaver, yeah, Beaver Dam. And oh, so you're talking about like the Hopkins uh, area, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so that's going to change a lot of the stuff that's moving around in these local watersheds. Coastal Club, the Coastal Club touches Love Creek. Yeah, and that's actually so the the Hopkins area actually probably would drain into the, what's the Jimtown sample that Denerick samples at. Um, and so that is, you know, heavily monitored, but it, actually I should look at the data and see if it's changed because the cow removal was, I think, what a year or two ago. So. I'll be interested to look at the historic data and see over time if it's shifting and if the number has uh, increased. With climate change, do you see uh, increase? Maybe you haven't got enough uh, time element, but with the increasing temperatures, does that influence the whole process? Yeah, so great question. And one thing that is of a concern, right, is if we think about the idea of like a gut bacterium. So your gut bacteria are happy usually at, I don't know what the Fahrenheit is, but 37 degrees Celsius. Um, and so uh, our waters are typically, you know, in the 20s, and so they're a much lower temperature. And so that's actually a, a protector for us, right? It means that the gut bacteria can't grow as well when they're outside the gut because it's too cold for them. But of course, if you've got local, you know, uh, increasing water temperatures, um, higher land temperatures, then you've got to think about these issues about the gut bacteria actually might live a lot better in the future. Um, and so this is one of the other reasons we're doing the study is to get some baseline data about what things look like and then be able to ask questions in the future on if you know water temperature is really impacting things or um, you know how things are shifting but at this point the study doesn't have enough data to really talk about that um, my bigger concern is the hydrology changes that happen with climate change and this idea that we'd have more powerful hurricanes um, we'd have more, potentially more water being dumped on the land right of course flushing everything into the waterways um, and of course that is a somewhat more short-lived issue but it might actually change our local water quality in terms of that sort of week to week changes that we see um, and make sure, you know, it basically mixes everything else. Around. So um, those are all sort of concerns to have. Okay. Questions on Zoom? Yep, yeah. I've got a couple come in. One about samples. Um, Ted wants to know if a human eats turkey, does the DNA <laughs> tracking indicate turkey? <laughs> so that is a, a great question, um, but it turns out no, um, because you break the turkey down, right? And so you would, uh, you basically have a signal of like you ate protein. Um, and so we could actually usually tell the difference about, you know, if you're eating protein or vegetables, but again, our human signals are all mixed. There are hundreds of, of populations together. Um, so we're not that uh, deconvoluted. So um, what's fun fact though, was it Ted? So fun fact for Ted is that um, most of the time, the food source that you eat, of course you digest it, it, it turns out, but there are some studies that show that you can actually because okay, I feel like gross talking about this, but like, okay, we all, some things survive your gut, right? You'll see seeds come through and other things. Um, there was this fantastic study that showed that things like uh, pepper uh, mosaic virus, this is a virus that infects pepper, that you can actually, if you eat an infected pepper, of course, you won't really know it's infected, right? It just maybe it had a blemish on it or something, um, but you'll actually, that survives the gut tract. Um, and so that's actually a concern with the way you use uh, spent sewage. And so if you're not familiar, of course, some people's treatment of sewage is that they spread it on a farm field. Of course, if you're doing that, you might be putting active pepper virus on a pepper field and thinking about things like that. So there are cycles like that can that can happen, but not usually like the food source, but it'd be more like if it's something that comes around through a seed or something like that. So I don't know why I know that, but that is a random factor tonight. Seeds are made to survive the digestive tract. Basically, and that's half the time, that's how they germinate, right? Perfect. So it pooped out. Yep. It's got a nice little warm pile of stuff yeah. to, to start growing. Yep. I think I remember hearing that there's microbes that actually live in the pools in Yellowstone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and that's actually, so that's actually how we did all the studies. So one of the famous ones is Thermus aquaticus, and it is a heat-loving bacteria. Um, it grows best at 72 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that is actually how we got the heat-stable polymerases to basically do the sequencing and the PCR techniques um, that you know, are now completely commonplace, right? Um, and so if we think about actually, if we think about PCR, I'm sure everyone here has had a PCR test recently. So um, this idea that now it's so commonplace and that actually all came out of the Yellowstone background. Um, so yeah, so there's uh, things that, like I said, until it gets over 121 degrees Celsius, you have um, a lot of potential for things to grow, so. Any other questions on Zoom? Well, we have um, two, two others. Uh, I'll read the first from Sam and Diane. They said, and this came in early, but I made a note. They said, the chicken plant, Alan Hearn, is nearby. I think this was when you were talking about Love Creek. Yeah. And has been fined many times for pouring pollutants into nearby waterways. And you may or may not be able to answer this, but they want to know what, if anything, EPA or DENREC does about that. Yeah, so all of the... Um, Waterways are monitored for nutrients, and there's been, of course, lawsuits over this. Uh, and so that's uh, an area I'm like I can't really speak on, except that I've read it in the newspaper, probably as everyone else has. Um, and I will say the biggest concern with the chicken plants has been that nutrient load, right? So it's this idea of things like high nitrogen um, become an issue. Uh, there actually hasn't been much discussion about the fact that there might be mi uh, microbes going along with that. And so again, it's this sort of difference about do you worry so much about the nutrients or do you worry about the actual bacteria? Um, and there it was, is the nutrient is, is issue and the aquifers are the biggest problem. So that's as far as I'll speak on it because I actually don't have uh, exact knowledge on that. Yeah, their, their other question was kind of tangentially related in that it's also not microbes, but they're curious about um, the chemicals used to treat things and how that affects whether water is high in quality, safe to drink. Yeah, so, okay, so something to share with everyone, of course, is that we think about what's called an emerging contaminant. Um, one of the emerging contaminants in the area is microplastics. Um, and so I think, is there a talk on that in the series, I think? Or I don't know, there's always seems to be talk on microplastics locally, um, but- Other than microplastics. Yeah, um, but then also this uh, concern about PFAS, which is a um, fluorinated compound that's used in a lot of different things uh, like fire extinguishers and whatnot. Um, and so things like that are, of course, a big issue. And this is actually sort of one of these um, sort of debates is that a lot of these things are not required to be monitored. Um, so now people are starting to monitor them um, to think about that. And I can even tell you crazy stories about the fact that you could actually find cocaine in local waterways and find out where all of the places where drugs are being made based on water quality, right? So we can track all of these things, but they're not required or mandated. Um, but that these are things that are in the local waterways. Um, the sort of good news, bad news is a lot of these are broken down naturally. Um, the plastics do are longer lived. Um, a lot of pharmaceuticals you can actually see flush out. Those typically get broken down if they're in contact with sunlight. Um, and so there is sort of natural remediation for some of these compounds. But of course, there's this concern that there's these emerging contaminants, um, which you know are something that are, are of concern. And of course, something to sort of lobby and, and argue for to make sure that we are monitoring more carefully. Um, there's actually a lot of my colleagues now who won't do work, especially in sort of rural stream areas. Um, part of that is that they were able to track the meth lab so easily. Um, and so if, if you wanted to do that, we could do it, but it takes time and effort. Um, and, and a lot of people actually uh, for research sort of started saying like, this is maybe not the area I want to be in, right? If you watch too much Breaking Bad. Um, and so, uh, but it is, you can track a lot of things in water. Um, and and now of course, a lot of these could be useful, but of course, not always paid attention to. So. We, we talked about a properly maintained septic system. The microbes don't go into the septic system through the sand and back out to the bay? So that's the concern is that if you have um, an overflowing tank, it's going to be worse, of course, um, that ideally what should happen is most of the biomass, which keeps most of the microbes in the septic tank, should stay in the tank. And that's why it has to get pumped. Um, what hopefully is flowing out is that, again, that treated water. And this is- I'll have a drainage field. Yeah. And so this is what our thing is. There should, like, the theory is there should be enough filtration, right? That's the theory. But the particle size of the microbes bigger than the sand space. So good question. Locally, we have so much sand that I would say the microbes can just get right through. Um, in a clayey area, you would have more trouble perhaps getting you know, a root out. Um, but it does look like a lot of the microbes actually could be washing out fairly easily. Um, so the, you know, they are small enough to basically travel through porous spaces. So anytime there's a lot of water flow, there's probably a microbial flow too. I was trying to go for the reverse. When we have a drought 
because it actually come out of the sand where it wouldn't have flowed when we when we have high water. Do you mean it would get stuck in the sand? Yeah, it's or? stuck in the sand because the water level doesn't have any delta. Yeah, well, that's an interesting the, question. If the water goes down, does it then come out? Which we haven't looked that much with Mike Bot. Yeah, I, I actually wouldn't know. I mean, if because you would also have to, it would have to like last, right? And if it's a drought, it's theoretically hot, you know. No, I'm and, saying in a water table, it's just stagnant. Yeah. It's down there. Yeah. It, it's in eight feet of water, but it's not moving. Yeah. So I don't actually know what that would wind up looking like in terms of when it flushes out eventually. But it won't um, come through the sand. Particle size is probably would be able to come through, yeah. 30 microns or something. Yeah. So, I mean, again, the microbes we're talking about are maybe one to two microns uh, yeah. total size, so that they're, it's pretty easy for them to float around. And hmm. I should just mention also one thing to think about, too, because I think about this way too much, is that when we think about our local watersheds, we actually have this idea of sort of these paleo channels. Um, and I think of like, again, I know my property, eight, you know, when you go past eight inches, it's all sand, right? Um, but when I started looking at some of the geology in these areas, there's actually some real gravel areas. And it's something that um, I don't think we even consider with development or placement of any of these things in that um, we don't have a consistent sort of sand base. Sometimes there's just these big areas where there could be a ton of transport because it's basically a rock base. Um, so that's something I'm starting to look into and talking to some local geologists about too, is can we map any of these features on areas where we might see sort of a bigger influence versus a non-bigger influence. But that's, again, a detail for the future, so. Great, thanks. Right, thank you. Right. Hopefully it's not raining. Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's a heavy downpour about halfway through. Yeah. I haven't heard anything since. All right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. And I think Joanna is going to. Yeah, I was just gonna gonna wrap up. I did want to thank everybody for coming. We had a really robust audience on um, Zoom, so thanks for joining us remotely. Um, and thank you to those of you who were um, in person. I do want to encourage you to join us again for our next um, uh, speaker, who will be Dr. Clara Chan. She will be talking about microbes next uh, next time, two weeks from now, on the sixteenth. Um, but from a very different perspective, the title of her talk is The Tiniest Architects on Earth, How Microbes Make Minerals. So kind of a different perspective on microbes. Um, we do require registration. Um, and so if you haven't registered for that talk or for any other future talks, you can just email alumnet, A-L-U-M, net at udel.edu with your name, the email that you use to register and um, the future lectures you'd love to attend. But before we go, I just wanted to give a big thank you to Dr. Jen Biddle for um, entertaining us this evening with this walk through the microbial world of um, who's, who's entering our waterways and where they're coming from. So thank you, Jen. And uh, good night to everybody. <laughs>